Who do we have? Oh, we have two, three. Happy days. Let's give it a minute for a few more people to join. Five. Happy days. Right, we'll get started. Um, I'm Ben Rochford. I run Pud Pud's Pet Services in Tameside, which is on the outskirts of Manchester. A lot of people think it's up near Newcastle for some reason. Um, predominantly work with dogs who, for their own respective reasons, need one-to-one -one care. Um, they could be frustrated greeters, dog reactive, people reactive. Some of them don't really sort of trust new people, unfamiliar people, um, that well or quickly. Oh, my wife's watching. Um, I started off, which is predominantly what I'm going to be talking about, um, in the shelter that I worked at. Um, which was here, which I touched on on my last live. Which was a small animal shelter. It wasn't like a, lo uh, a big nationwide thing. It was just a local small one. Um... Oh, hi Gemma. Glad you're looking forward to it. And Cathy. Um, yeah, it was a small local animal shelter. On financial terms and stuff like that, it couldn't compete with things like Dogs Trust, RSPCA and stuff like that. Um, but we did everything that we possibly could for the dogs and cats that came into our care and chickens. Um, and the main dog I'm going to talk about is a dog who was called Sunshine, who came to us. Um, he's now called Sonny, um, and I'm still in touch on social media with the people who adopted him. Um, and he's living the best life ever. But he came to us from another shelter, or rescue, who was down south. Um, and he was labelled with everything. Um, anything you could think of. He was deemed to have it at a year old. Uh, he was kennel aggressive. He was lead aggressive. He would guard his food, toys. Uh, you couldn't put a collar on him. It took me about six months. He did have a massive thing with his neck. You couldn't touch his neck. Um, what else was there with him? People aggressive, dog aggressive. He was just labelled with everything. And how it was portrayed to me, I was only a volunteer at the time, was where he had come from. They had deemed Sunshine at a year old to be a good candidate, uh, to be euthanised, to be put to sleep, that he was beyond help. Uh, he would never get into a forever home. He would never be even close to being a normal dog because of his issues. He did have quite a lot. He, there's no denying he wasn't wrongly labelled or anything like that, although he did have quite a lot of labels attached to him. Um, in the previous... Hi, Helen. Um, yeah, in the previous shelter, basically no one could get in the kennel with him. He turned into this little Tasmanian devil with teeth. Um, he was a staffy cross. We never really discovered what he was crossed with, but you knew that there was staffy in him. Um, and I started volunteering there, not long after our dog had passed away. And for some reason, for whatever reason, I couldn't even tell you why I didn't, I don't think I did anything special. Um, he clicked with me and he allowed me into his kennel. Um... It took a little bit of work leading up to that, uh, so I'd sit outside of his kennel, I would kind of be on the ground. At the time I didn't know it because I hadn't done any canine body language sort of courses or very much in form of CPD. Um, but I was keeping my body language without knowing it, sort of non-threatening, I wasn't doing any direct eye contact, I wasn't leering over him, I wasn't pressurising him into anything, I was just sort of every now and then just pop a treat through the bars of the kennel gradually let me into the kennel um and he was i wouldn't say he was he was completely comfortable but he, he was tolerating it in the beginning in the early days um he would just go back into the back part of the kennel where his bed was and his food was uh, and the outside bit space so sort of, he would just sort of kind of pop his head through um and gradually i just sort of i lured him really with treats um to show that i wasn't a threat i wasn't going to do anything i wasn't going to take his toys or his bedding or anything like that no one else at the shelter um even like the staff who were really experienced and the other volunteers who were really experienced he would not let them into his kennel no matter what they had they could literally have had ribeye steak in their treat pouches he was not letting them in he just became teeth um and gradually i built up a little bit of a bond he just clicked with me for some reason um and I worked with him for several months, several months. And that's it. it took, it was roughly somewhere about six, seven months before I could put a collar on him. Um, we never really got 
down to the bottom of what his issue was. There was many theories posted about amongst the staff and volunteers that has he been swung round on a lead, has he been kicked, has he had the lead yanked, um, he had a real issue with anyone. To, you couldn't even like just stroke him, you couldn't touch his neck area. Um, the vets and that, they checked him out, they said they couldn't, they couldn't feel anything, there was nothing to give them an inkling that he, he had damage or anything in his neck. Um, and one day, like I say, we've been working a long time at this point. I took a collar in with me and I thought, if he bites me, he bites me, but I'm gonna, I'm just gonna try it. And I just put the collar down on the floor. I did our normal routine, which you might have seen in a couple of the pictures. He jumped on me, he was all happy and smiley, he was licking my face. I let him just sniff the collar, let him do whatever he wanted. If he wanted to destroy it, bury it in his bed, he could do whatever he wanted. Um, and he just sat, offered me a paw, and it was kind of like he sort of, he was in tune with me, he just sort of knew that this was going to happen, and he just sort of kind of like rested his head forward and just let me stick the collar on, and he was great. Um, and, yeah, like I said, I'm still in touch with the people who adopted him, um, but I did put the blockers on quite a few who wanted to adopt him, because when he came to us, he was called Sunshine, and so many people wanted to change his name, they wanted to do this, they just wanted to rush and get a perfect dog. Um... And I was just, I just, he, he wasn't, they weren't the right fit for him um, until a lady called Lacey came along and she came into the kennel with me and she had no treats, she had no toys, nothing like that. Um, so she wasn't trying to lure him or gain affection from him through treats and toys and stuff like that. She just sat down on the floor. She followed my lead, so to speak. I said, like, no sudden movements, don't sort of stand over him. Um, just let him come to you if he wants. In the initial first few meetings, he might not come to you because uh, he is very wary of new people. Um, and he just went straight to her, went straight to her. He was all over her, licking her face, having cuddles, having fuss. And I was just like, you're the people. If you pass the home check, he's your dog. Um, but it was a lot of work with Sunshine. Um, on his kennel aggression... The lead working on him being calm on a lead for him to just walk calmly because he did he literally just bit his way up the lead he became a tasmanian devil um so it was either something really negative had happened to him hi debbie um yeah it was either something really really negative had happened to him with the lead or he just wasn't actually that used to being on a lead um like a lot of rescue centres, and it is personal preference, with Sunshine for a long time, we had to use a slip collar, slip lead. I personally didn't like it, uh, but that was the only way, really, we could get him out of his kennel to go on a walk. Um, just trying to get a harness on him again, because he was going over his neck, he wasn't happy. We tried other ones where he sort of, you don't have to go over the neck, it comes under the body. He wasn't really sort of working with that at the time. So little things were in place that we were working on with him. Oh, well, predominantly me, because quite a lot of people, he wouldn't even let them get close. Um, and he was a challenge, which, like I say, at the time, I touched on it on my previous live. Realistically, I wasn't qualified um, to be working with a dog like Sunshine, because I'm not a behaviourist. I'm not certified behaviourist or anything like that. I was just doing things that I thought came natural that you should do with a dog like this, because it was clear he wasn't comfortable in a lot of situations. Um... So, it's fantastic that you adapted to his needs. Yeah, it is, Leah. Um, I just kind of read him, even though at the time I didn't realise that was what I was doing. Because um, like I say it was before I'd done any CPD or any canine body language courses, any puppy classes, stuff like that, IMDT and different things. I'd, well before I did any of that. Um and basically, he, he was a dog who would have been put to sleep at a year old if the shelter didn't take him on and he didn't click with someone. Um, and sadly, that is the case for a lot of these dogs that they don't get the chance. They don't meet that person or the, the, the rescue centre that can give them the time that they need to decompress um, and to just... Because that, also, that is what he needed. A lot of downtime um, to just sort of process what was going on. Because obviously... Anyone who, even if you've only visited a rescue centre or a shelter, I mean, I know stuff like Dogs Trust and that now 
their centres and stuff are amazing and they've got underfloor heating and the dogs can't actually see each other but not every rescue centre can afford that to, to be to build a rescue centre to that sort of standard in terms of the build quality and everything. They can be really noisy, um, a lot of metal gates and doors and sort of slides in between the outside bit and the inside bit where they go to sleep and stuff. There's a lot of comings and goings, there's staff, there's volunteers, there's people looking at dogs um, and they sort of, they're constantly on show. Um, so they rarely get that downtime. But the sad thing is I, I found looking back now that um, really their downtime was when they went, they left the shelter on a walk with a, either a member of staff or a volunteer. They were away of all that hustle and bustle and the constant of the doors clanging and stuff because you're going in and you're picking up poo and wheel all day and changing beds and cleaning up, refreshing water bowls that have been knocked over and stuff like that. Um, and, and Sonny, or Sunshine as he was known at the time, he did need a lot of downtime um, where I just sat with him in the kennel, didn't do anything. I didn't do any training. I wasn't asking him to do tricks. It was just being with him. Um, and if he chose to come to me, he could come to me, but I would just literally sit on the floor um, in the outside bit for quite a long time. And it was about two or three months, he sort of, he initiated a game of sort of tug with one of the toys that he had. And he sort of kind of pulled me into the back where his bed was and stuff like that. Um, I thought this can go one of two ways. He's either, he's going to continue the game um, and have fun or in a very sort of small enclosed space, I could get quite badly hurt. Um, but I went with it and he kind of invited me into his bed. So I sat in his bed with him um, and literally just cuddled, sat with him and let him come and go. There was no pressure on him that he had to stay with me. And if I felt he was getting uncomfortable, I would just go back to the outside part. Um, I used to get in trouble quite a lot at the shelter because I used to spend a lot of time with the dogs that needed that extra time. Um, like the other dog who I put pictures up, um, the big dog, uh, he was called Bobby. I called him Bobby the Bosnian Bear because he came from Bosnia. Uh, he was a street dog. And he came with all, everything was above board. He had his passport and everything. He had all the inoculations and everything he needed before he traveled. Um, but when he came, sadly, it was all about the the good story of we've saved the street dog and getting him on social media and pictures and people wanting to meet him when really he needed a few days to just chill um, and decompress because he'd, he'd come from over there where he, he was taken off the streets into a big pound um, that were doing the best. They were doing the best for them, but a lot of dogs were in the same enclosure, if you like, um, and kind of fighting for food. Uh, so obviously a dog of his size is not is rarely going to lose because he was huge. Um, and he did have resource guarding issues, um, especially around food, his water bowl. Um, later on, it became his bed because he'd never really been used to a bed. Um, and we had an amazing volunteer there and she used to make the most amazing beds for all the dogs. Like they were two, three foot thick in blankets and duvets and cushions. And she made them amazing. Honestly, you'd pay a lot of money to go and stay in a hotel to get a bed that comfy. Um, and yeah, he, he should have been given time away before all the social media and stuff and just been allowed to decompress and just chill out and get over the traveling. Cause he would, he'd literally just travel from Bosnia straight to us. Um, and he was an interesting one. He was very interesting. Because he had to be taken out on a walk for his bedding to be changed, for food bowls and everything to be taken out. Because uh, they said he would go for you. We were told by the people who transported him he would go for you if he went for his food bowls, if he was in the environment. Um, and I went in one day and literally it was just to clean up a poo. He'd been with us. I think at that point, I think he'd been about a week he'd been with us. Um, and he was sat in the back of his kennel. He was quite chilled out. He was relaxed. There was no food bowls and that. His water bowl was near him. I wasn't any sort of threat. I was just cleaning up the poo bowl. Uh, the poo, sorry. Uh, and he grabbed me by the chest with his teeth and he flung me around like a rag doll around the kennel. I battered against all the walls. Dragged me into the back of the kennel. 
threw me into his bed and laid on top of me. All the way through this, I'm thinking, this is a dog who is probably somewhere between 10, 12 stone. He's a big, big dog. Paws like a lion. He's got head like a bear. Um, don't try and fight it. Don't try and sort of do anything. I just remained calm. Let him do what he needed to do. Um, spoke in really sort of hushed tones and stuff once he'd sort of calmed down and he was on top of me. Um, calmly got myself out of there. Um, went and had a cigarette and a cup of coffee and went straight back into his kennel, popped his harness on, lead, went on a big walk through the woods and we were best mates from that day forward. And I couldn't tell you what that was about because he never did that again with me, he never did it again with anyone else. Um, there was no blood, he didn't hurt me in any way, he just flung me around like a rag dog. Um, and he had the power to do it, he was a big, big dog. Um... So he was quite interesting. He sort of, he trusted you quite quickly, really. Um, it was just you had to be very, very aware and on it not to enter if his food and stuff was still in there or if someone had thrown some treats in. Um, you just, you just, it was safety. You didn't go in and put him in the position where he felt he had to do anything. Um, and it was just a shame, really, that the shelter just wasn't in a financial position to bring in, like, a certified behaviourist to work with a lot of these dogs and to give us an education on how to better work with them. Because we were doing everything we possibly could um, that we felt was right, um, but really we just didn't have the education and the knowledge to be working with dogs that were being brought to us that had behavioural issues. It was a shame. Um, another dog that we had that was brought to us, um, he was called Tawny. He was a big staffy. Uh, he was brought to us via the social worker after they'd removed children from the home. Um, he'd basically been kept outside for the five, five and a half years. They had him outside, no shelter, fed on scraps and packets of crisps and stuff like that. Um, he was okay with certain people um good for you for getting straight back in there yeah with bobby the bosnian bear um most people i think probably would have thought do you know what he's just flung me around the kennel he's battered me against like the metal sides of the walls and everything and he's dragged me into the back of the kennel he's dropped me in his bed and sat on top of me and he weighs more than me most people probably would never have had anything to do with that dog again um, and probably would have labelled him seriously aggressive and stuff. I just thought, do you know what, this dog needs a buddy, he needs a friend. Um, so I'm going straight back in there and I'm taking him out for a walk and we're going to be friends one way or the other. And he was great from that day on. Um, there was, like I say, I couldn't even put my finger on it because there was nothing untoward going on. Rescues are my passion, but I often feel rescues fail street dogs by sending them too soon to well-meaning but unsuspecting family. Oh, one second. I understand why, but it's like the quick fix scenario, high risk and fallout from it in my area. Really needs reviewed. Loving your life. Oh, thank you, Jojo. Um, yeah. I'm absolutely on you with that because Bobby was rehomed after I left that shelter uh, to someone. I've only heard it through the grapevine, so I, I don't know whether it was true or not, but apparently it wasn't the best home for him. Um, but we won't touch on that because I don't have any evidence to support one way or the other. Um, but then I also, through my business, what I have now, um, I've got a... Uh, Romanian street dog called Waffle. He's a Labrador cross question mark. Uh, he's absolutely petrified of men. He's another dog that I wanted to talk to about on this. Uh, when I first met him, if I'd have took his behaviour and stuff as excitement and stuff like that, he would have put me in hospital. Absolutely no doubt about it. Even though he's this skinny little Labrador thing, um, I think some people maybe would have took him sort of going up on his legs and even though the tail was wagging his teeth and everything and just his demeanor were telling me do, do not get too close um he's absolutely petrified of men um 
we don't know why. His owner, well, his owners, um, Waffle doesn't really have much to do with the husband, and the husband really doesn't have much to do with him. Um, and on my Facebook page, like his owner quite often writes on like his posts and his pictures that I'm like his favourite person in the world. Like they can't believe how different he is with me. Um, he has he has bitten a male member of their family at the workplace, um, which was quite sad. It was just a nip, but. Um, because she takes the dogs to work, they go into the office where she is, and it's a factory. Um, and one of the gentlemen who works there is a member of their family. And he'd forgot that Waffle has an issue with one of the doors. If you're going through that door, and you're not his owner, her mum and dad, or another lady who works in that office, he goes for you. Uh, but if you're going through the door that's round the other side, he doesn't care one jot. Um, and this gentleman had just forgot and popped his head round. And he was asking about something to do with an order and he bit him. Do you think it was just like very inappropriate initiation to try and play with you rather than true aggression? And he wanted to interact, but just didn't have a clue how. The Bosnian bear. Um, good one, Ruby. I really don't know on that one with, because like I say, I was, I'd literally, there was no food. His water bowl was near his bed at the back. I was probably a good six, eight feet away, just going in to clean the poo up, because um, obviously it was during, well, we clean it up anyway, but obviously you've got public coming into the shelter and they're looking at dogs, the last thing they want to see is dirty kennels. Hi, Leon. Um, and like I say, he literally just grabbed me by my chest and he flung me around like a rag doll. Um, but he was a true street dog. Um, very little interaction with people other than when he was caught and captured on the streets um, and taken to their local sort of rescue centre, pound, whatever it was. Um, and he, he was just a dog that had to be really well managed. We have a street dog and doesn't trust humans except us. Any advice for human introductions? Um... I don't really like giving out advice over the internet because you've not met the dog or assessed or anything like that. Jackie, is your dog a Romanian rescue dog, street dog? Let's just wait and see. Oh, from Morocco. All right, I was going to say, if it was from Romania, I know that there's a lady called Mish Masters who runs a dog's point of view, and she's a Romanian dog specialist. That's all she works with. Um, street dogs. Morocco. I mean, I suppose there could be um, crossovers and stuff like that in how to do it because how i did it with waffle um like i said when i first met him he probably would have put me in hospital um if i'd have just mistook his body language and how he was um for being playful and stuff and with him it was ham um and there's a video by lewis nichols who does ignore my dog on his dog training page it's a good few years old now um how he built up trust and bond with a really nervous dog. And he's just in a room with this little dog. And she controls the complete environment, everything. And all he does is stay side on, no direct eye contact. He drops a treat, walks away, and then let the dog come to him. And any time the dog sort of goes towards him, he drops another treat, walks away. Everything's slow, steady, considered, no sort of movement, stuff like that. And it was that kind of approach that I had with Waffle, uh, but just using ham. Ham was his big thing. His owners were pretty thingy on that, that ham was the key to his heart. Um, and that was all I did. I sort of I stayed quite low to the ground. Um, 
dropped a bit of ham, moved, he came to me, dropped a bit of ham, I moved again. Um, and then after about 15, 20 minutes of doing this, he just completely changed again. Um, and he was super, super friendly and his owner literally just went, well, there's the lead. Are you going to take him for a walk? And I did. Um, and we've been best mates ever since. And we've done things like Steve Mann's rucksack walk and different things. Um, cause even though he trusts me and his owner say, I'm like the, his most favorite person on the planet. When we're out on walks, he doesn't, he doesn't seek out or want affection or any sort of contact. He'll look to you for sort of backup if he's unsure of something, especially of the dogs or other people, cyclists, horses and different things that we're coming across that some of them are really alien to him. Um, but actual physical touch, he doesn't really initiate that. But picking him up or dropping him off at his owner's workplace, he can't get enough of cuddles. But out on walk, it's not his thing. Um, so we've done stuff like the Steve Mann Rooks at walk, which can be really good. But I've not worked with a dog who's come from Morocco. But I would imagine that there's a lot of crossovers from dogs who come from like Romania, Bosnia, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, and those sorts of places. Um, how long have you had the dog from Morocco? Why are you right that I suppose but um another dog that I can talk about is a dog that I met after I set up Pud Pud's pet services. We've had him for a year and a half. So he's been with you a year and a half. So I would imagine he's really settled into your routine. Um in terms of your home, the comings and goings and everything like that, where you go for walks. He's very lovely to us, but does not trust anyone else. Um, kind of sounds like very typical of sort of street dogs. Um, how can you put it? They're very naturally sort of wary and cautious and they're constantly assessing um, what's safe, what's not safe. Um, like Waffle does it a lot. At the time I didn't really realize it, but Bobby did the same out on walks. Um, he would literally just stop and the dog or the person, the jogger, the kid on a skateboard, whatever, can be two, three hundred metres up the track or across the park or across the field, whatever it might be. Um, and he will literally just stand and observe, just watch, 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 watch. And then he'll just sort of check in with me. He'll watch again and then he'll walk on. Um, so they don't automatically really sort of trust straight away, which can be quite disheartening for owners. Um to see because they've got this cute little puppy or adolescent dog that's been saved from the streets and potentially a really horrific life. Um, but the dog really doesn't want to interact with loads of people and stuff like that, and that's fine. Um, you've kind of just got to adapt to your dog. Um, some people use like the, the disco dog or the library dog and different sort of concepts of what their dog is. Um, and it's perfectly okay if your dog is a library dog that really doesn't want to interact with everyone he meets or she um, or every dog and stuff like that. So like with Waffle, he's really, really scared of men. Um, anyone wearing gloves, there's a big thing about gloves. Um, so we avoid men um, or we keep them at a safe distance anyway, especially when we're out in public, just because he can react. Um, and it's not out and out aggression. It's more of a make myself as big and scary as I can, make the big scary thing go away. Um, it's that type of reaction that he's having. And he just wants you to leave him alone, go away. Um, so we have like the nervous lead and stuff for him. I wear stuff like that, ignore my dog. Um, verbally, I'll ask people, just, just ignore us, just pretend we're not here. Uh, my dog doesn't want to interact with you. Um, it's nothing personal, it's just his personality, his way, and we're working on these things. So I would rather he have a positive interaction on his terms when he's calm, he's relaxed, he's comfortable. Even if that interaction literally lasts a second, the blink of an eye, if you can read your dog and the dog's starting to get uncomfortable, walk on. 
an interaction doesn't have to last five minutes or ten minutes or anything like that it can be really really slow um, and quick so everything at, at your dog's pace um, yeah they, they don't have to be sort of disco dogs and into everything and love everybody it's it's perfectly okay just like people um, you know some of us are extroverts and we're life and soul of the party and we're here there and everywhere and, and then other people who are really introverted and you know, they don't want that attention they don't want to be the life and soul of the party and stuff like that and dogs can be the same um, which brings me on to what i was starting to talk about um, with indy um he's a german shepherd cross collie he's the result of a homeless man's dog getting mated um the rspca took the homeless gentleman's dog while she had the puppies and raised them and then his dog was returned to him they rehomed the puppies indy was one of them and his owners have had him from being eight ten weeks old however old he was when they got him <clears throat> he's never had a bad experience he's never been mistreated he's never been kicked punched he's never had aversive training methods or anything used on him they absolutely idolize indy they dote on him um but he's naturally a very, very sort of nervous, wary, anxious type dog. It took me eight months to gain his trust. Going every week to his owner's home, throwing his tennis balls, offering treats, just sat having a coffee with his owners, um, different things. And it was probably somewhere in the region of about six months of doing that religiously before he even let me just very and i mean briefly literally the blink of an eye sort of stroke the side of his body that was it that was all he would allow me to do for six months he was happy for me to be in the house he never was aggressive or anything he was just very skittish and he would remain in the opposite end of the living room which was sort of became the dining area into the kitchen i could throw his tennis balls he would sort of bring them and he would drop them about four foot away from me and then he would back away that is as close as he would come um, for quite a long time so he was my biggest challenge to date i would say in terms of gaining a dog's trust because i just every approach i thought this is going to work this is going to work this is going no it didn't um and he's just naturally like that even now um, like I say, it took about eight, eight and a half months to gain his trust, going every week. Um, and now when I put the key in the door and I go to pick him up on his walks, he's literally all over me. Um, I'm like his best friend. And when I pet sit him, he sleeps with me on the air mattress in the spare room and stuff like that. He, he's literally by my side. He's glued to me. But it took a long time to gain that trust. Yep, slow is fast. Fast is slow. Absolutely right, Ruby. Um... But there was no pressure on Indy. Um, there was more pressure on me because the family had booked to go on a once in a lifetime holiday to Florida and do all the different theme parks and all the Harry Potter stuff and all that. And sort of time was ticking on. We were getting there because they didn't want to put him in kennels because they knew just how nervous and shy he was that he probably he would never leave the kennel in the entire time they were away. Um, and it was literally, I think, the last visit before they flew out on like the Monday or something. I think I did the visit on the Friday night and something clicked. And he just came to the front door and he greeted me like I was his best mate. Um, and it was like, whew, that is absolutely relief. Um, and he's been amazing ever since. Um, out on walks, he will do a big arc. He will avoid anyone he doesn't know, other dogs. He doesn't want to interact that's just his natural personality it's not because he's been mistreated or neglected or anything like that he's just naturally what a lot of people deem the library dog he's really introverted and that's fine um, he can be off lead with me and his owners play with his tennis ball we hide it we throw it so into the long grass play different games around his tennis ball so it's not constantly just chase 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 Did you cry when he did? Hmm? Cry when who cried? Who cried? I don't get that one, Ruby. 
Who cried? Did I say someone cried? Um, but yeah, working with Indy, that, that was a testament. Because I kept saying to his owners, like, I'm going to win this dog over one way or the other. Dogs have individualised temperament. Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, obviously, working with a lot of dogs, um, of different breeds, crossbreeds, stuff like that, you do take into account their breed or their crossbreed. Breed traits that are associated came up to you for the first time and greeted you. Um, I didn't cry, but I was quite emotional um, because that was like eight months... And I didn't charge the owners a penny. I was going every week for free to try and gain this dog's trust. Um, and I saw it as, in a kind of way, sort of a learning experience for me because I'd never met a dog who wasn't... who was kind of like Indy. It, it was not easy to gain his trust. You had to work for his love and affection. Um, and then it has to be maintained going on um, because they said their eldest son had gone away to university um, he didn't come home for the first couple of years when he did come home he put on a little bit of weight he'd grown his hair he'd grown a beard he didn't look the same and Indy treated him as if he was a complete stranger you know and he'd grown up with him he'd lived in the same house with him for many many years um, he wouldn't take treats off him, he wouldn't let him stroke him, he just avoided him. Um, but yeah, it's a massive, massive win to... Uh, in your opinion, would you say behaviour was genetic with Indy? Um, I would say so. But I'm never going to know who the homeless man's dog was um, or the other dog that mated. Um, which way round it was uh, well obviously the homeless man's dog was the bitch um, but you know were they of nervous dispositions and stuff like that Was he? I think it probably was more genetics than anything else with Indy um, but now you see him out and about with me in the park and he's off lead and stuff as, as long as you sort of give him space he's quite happy um my dog did this. Oh, hang on. My dog did the same. Not a street dog, but he was picked up as a stray, purebred Doberman. So it's both personality and breed to watch and assess. I learned to let him make his own judgment and redirect. Possibly remove us from the situation if he's uncomfortable and walks. He wants nothing to do with strangers. But at the vets and stores, he's much more open and comfortable. Had him for a year. I feel like we're finally making progress on resource guarding. I don't think he's ever been played with or had ties. It's quite sad. That is quite sad, isn't it? Um, we had that with Pods. Uh, who I named my business after. She was a rescue staff. Found on the streets of Derby. Still expressing milk. Had been used as a breeding machine. And I think after we brought her home... It was about six, seven months. I mean, we did the usual thing that a lot of people do when they adopt dog. We literally... It sounds negative, but it came from a good place. We basically sort of flooded her, um, looking back now, with toys and beds and all the best stuff. It was like, you're never going to be used for breeding again. You're never going to be mistreated. You're never going to be smacked or anything like that. And we would give her... Now we call them her babies. Um, because if you say to her, go and get your baby, she'll go and get you one. Um, all the different toys and teddies and stuff like that. And she would literally just take it off you, put it in a bed, and then come back to you and look at you like, I don't know what to do. Um, so I can totally empathise on that, on not wanting to, or not really sort of sure what to do with toys. It took Pods about six, seven months before she started playing. Um, and I think she'd sort of, she'd started playing with toys for about a week and it was amazing to see and we were doing like the typical parents type thing if you like. We were filming and taking pictures and this is amazing. Um, and she knocked like a can of coke over while she was playing and she pancaked herself to the floor. Like, I can't even remember if that was the time that she actually like instantly went to the toilet, like wet herself. She was so scared that she'd knock something over and we we did not care. 
we did not care whatsoever. We were just happy that she was playing, but it was sad to see that kind of insight into her past that obviously if she did anything like that, it was a very negative part that um, happened to her. You could tell that she was kind of used that when stuff like that happened, she was she was going to be hit or kicked or shouted at. I've got 11 month old German Shepherd female. She had a few bad experiences of off lead dogs. Oh, hang on, hang on. Um, running at her, going for her while she's on lead. She's lead reactive, I think partly frustration. A bit anxious, off lead. She's total opposite, brilliant with dogs and people. Any tips for trust building activities or tips to help build trust in me? Um, I know I've mentioned it before, um, but a really good starting point, I really like working with a dog if they're comfortable, sort of relatively close to me, is the Steve Mann rucksack walk. Um, I really love using that as a good starting point because the dog's in full control of everything. They set the pace. Um, obviously, you don't have your phone. It's, I mean, I, I do it when I do it with the dogs that I care for. I, um, I'll set it up on a tripod so it's away and it can film us. Um, but you, you're not supposed to use your phone, so you're not checking email, Facebook, whatever. It's just you and your dog. Everything's spoken in hushed tones and stuff like that, and the dog completely leads everything. Um, and I find that is an amazing starting point. And play. Play. Because if you're having fun and your dog's having fun, that bonding and stuff is just happening. I struggle explaining to clients when the dog is extremely stressed, overly stimulated by all the love of new toys, should be introduced at the dog's pace. It is hard not to shower the dog with toys and affection. Absolutely, Amy, yeah. Like I say, that was um, kind of what we did and sort of looking back at it now, because that was before I started working professionally with dogs and stuff. Um, so I didn't know any better and I've made mistakes and I still continue to make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Um, yeah, we effectively, we, we did flood puds with toys and different things and affection and maybe we expected too much too soon, um, to a degree that she would just automatically play because you think you give a dog a toy, they're going to play, they're going to know what to do, but sadly not all dogs do and they haven't been exposed to that or know how to play, um, and it's quite sad. Amazing, we'll look into it and up our playing time with a purpose other than play. Thank you. Um, another good thing um, that I like, and it is becoming really popular now, uh, is like scent work. Because uh, you are working as a team and you've got to sort of follow your dog's lead, really. Um, so stuff like man trailing and stuff like that, that can be amazing for working with your dog and just gaining that um, bond and friendship together. You guys are awesome. I'm not being critical of you at all. Okay. Um, yeah, stuff like man trailing can be really, really good. Because um, I know I took a client's dog there. I took Dita uh, to an introduction to man trailing course. Um, absolutely phenomenal. Love it. It engages all their natural abilities and senses and stuff like that. Sense of smell, their olfactory system. They're working. They've got a purpose. Um and you learn to read your dog better. You learn to read their body language so much better. Um, so yeah, I would definitely look at like the scent work type stuff. I mean, it does depend on your dog, whether they like really high energy, really high fizzy stuff, or whether they like more library dog stuff, sort of really quiet, calm, relaxed, because um, man trailing can be a bit full on at times for stuff. Just watched a webinar earlier today about man trailing. Definitely going to look into it. Yeah, if she likes sniffing, find it games, absolutely. Um, yeah, I loved it with the man trailing. Um, who did we have on mine? Yeah, I took Dita. There was a lady there who had a really, I mean, a big shepherd who was people reactive. There was a little chihuahua. Can't remember what else. There was a real mixture of dogs, um, but all the dogs were worked individually, so none of the dogs met because there was a few reactive dogs there. Um, and if you find really good man trailing instructor in your area and stuff, they will accommodate if your dog's reactive and stuff in any way, or they'll point you in the direction of someone who can accommodate. Um, but I did mine with 
Dawn at Preston Trick Dogs. And it was amazing for Dita because she's a frustrated greeter and stuff like that. Uh, and she was the only one to cheat. She made on the last run of the day on the man trailing. She followed the track and then really she should have carried on round here and stuff like that. But she sort of stopped sniffing. She sort of looked up, looked to the side and saw the lady who had ran and hid for us hidden in a, in a bush and she went bang, got you. Um, so she was phenomenal at it. So yeah, yeah, I'd look at stuff like the Steve Mann Rooks Out Walk, Man Trailing, um, Agility, anything really where you and your dog sort of need to work together um, and you're really going to start. I think someone's bin just got knocked over outside. Yeah, anything where you and your dog are going to be sort of working together um, and you'll learn to read your dog so much better. Man trailing is amazing for reactive dogs. Yeah, it is. Um, so like I say, Dita is a frustrated greeter. She can be dog reactive, stuff like that. She can be quite sensitive. Um, and she was just phenomenal. She loved it. She got the concept of what we were doing really, really quickly. Um, and I think that was a mixture of Dawn's amazing instruction and sort of guidance on what we were doing and how to better work the long line because that is a bit of an art it isn't just simply let the dog have so much because we were obviously trailing in a public place um so yeah amazing for reactive dogs and it gives them a purpose because i know when i interviewed jack fenton uh, not long ago um, and he spoke about when he did his man trailing instructors course uh, and they spoke about a german shepherd that was really really human reactive and obviously they built it up over a period of time um, and they laid a trail through a train station somewhere in London or something and he just, or she, sniffed out and just totally didn't bother with all the people that normally he would have reacted to. What's that this? I once went to dry him off from the rain and he totally freaked out, rolled over, started to shut down, let him air dry now. Only in the past few months he started to play tag. He used to just stare at me. He still thinks I'm weird for running around for no reason. But goes along with it slowly and has a good time. If he's having a good time and he's comfortable, happy days. I have five rescue dogs, all from traumatic backgrounds. Dog meat trade. Oh, God. Poor things. Um, all of struggles, individual needs, scent play is the only activity I can get them all engaged. Man trailing is my next venture with one of my rescues that's shown some interest. Go with it, Helen. Um, I'm not sure if it's still available on the UK Sniffer Dogs page, but they had a course that was free in lockdown. And it was like five free exercises. Um, and one of them was like a... It wasn't man trailing, but it was like a tracking exercise that you can do in your garden where you can just sort of scent it with ham or whatever it might be. Um, and you can just start to get build the skills um, around tracking, that sort of stuff. Um, and honestly, for, for a free course, amazing. Um, you've got absolutely nothing to lose. Um, and it's run by Jamie Pound, uh, UK Sniffer Dogs. It's on their website, or it was up until recently because I did send it to a client recently. To look at it. I find sometimes it's hard to build the owner's confidence, especially when their dogs are having a tough time with their dog. We have seen dogs' confidence build when we are present, interacting, engaged, but then when the owners don't have us as a crutch and present both the owner's confidence and dog's confidence slips back, what do you feel gives the owner more confidence apart from highlighting all the good? they're doing and showing how far they've come in their journey obviously sort of giving the positive reinforcement when you're training your dogs the, the treat the toy the play the affection whatever it might be um, i like to try and do it with the owners as much as possible not concentrating on them not clicking quick enough or not rewarding quick enough um because then it can get very sort of negative Nelly sort of stuff going on that you're constantly picking fault. Um, giving them feedback on the great stuff that they're doing. Letting them know it's okay to have a hard time with your dog. Uh, especially like with your active, nervous, anxious, fearful dogs. Um, 
progress is not going to be one straight line to the end goal. There's going to be peaks and troughs. There's going to be setbacks. It's okay to feel frustrated. It's okay to feel a little bit angry. It's okay to think, am I the right person for this dog? Have open, honest conversations with your trainer, your dog walker, whoever you've brought in to help with your dog. Um, Because I I always talk about sort of your dog's village. Um, Like the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And with some dogs, it can take a village. And other dogs, some dogs have really big villages. Others have really small villages. So it could be the owners and a few members of the extended family. It could be a clinical behaviorist. It could be a dog walker. There could be daycare involved, the groomer. A mixture of different professionals could all be bringing something to the table to help the dog. Um, Because some of my dogs, uh, like I say, I'm not a behaviorist. Um, I'm just their dog walker. I'm not there as any other purpose other than dog walker and pet sitter but they have behaviorists and the vet teams and stuff like that. And we all work towards a better goal with them. What's this? Free work outside is helpful to let a dog acclimatize to the presence of a stranger. If people won't spend the time outside just with my dogs, they ain't coming in. Okay. When can I come and meet your dogs? Um, yeah, free work. Um, I do bits and pieces of that uh, with some of my dogs, like if they're having rest days where they're not going to go for a walk. Um, It's low energy, it's not really that fizzy for them. They set the pace again on if they want to interact with whatever I set out, where I hide treats and toys and different things. Um, Yeah, free work can be really, really good as well. And I've totally lost my train of thought now, um, thinking about free work, what I was talking about. Yeah, the the, the dog's village. and letting owners know it's okay to be having a hard time. Um, and the, there's, there's loads of memes and stuff that have been written about it. Like, you know, your dog's not giving you a hard time. They're having a hard time. Um, and don't take it personally. Your dog's not doing it to annoy you and all the rest of it. They, they, they're trying to communicate with you that, that they're really struggling um, with whatever that might be. And sometimes you have to adapt your approach to them or to help them or you have to take a step back however it might be um and it's just having those open con- honest conversations with the people that you bring in to help with your dog and, and another good thing that i found getting owners to do is to keep a diary not just focusing on when the dog's had a reaction or a really bad day or the dog appears like shut down stuff like that log all the good stuff you know today out on a walk my dog showed an interest in wanting to go over and say hello to another dog really calmly. Jot that down. Even if the dogs didn't interact, but your dog showed an interest in that happening, write it down. Um, and anything that's really positive, um, you know, if they've walked past a house where normally the dog would react because there's a dog in that window all the time and it didn't react, write it down. And when you're having a really bad day, sometimes it's good to just go back over and just read over the progress you've made with your dog. You know, do you know what? Yeah, we are making progress. It's not, we're not going to be winning any titles at Crufts next year, but we're having a great time. The dog is making progress. It's slow, and at times it can be really glacial progress. Um, and that's where the frustration and stuff can start to kick in, and the self doubt am I the right person for this dog? And, and that's quite sad. So, yeah, absolutely have those sorts of conversations with owners. So we've got, what, five minutes left. I tell my guys to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I covered a bit of sunshine, a little bit of sunshine story, a bit of indie story, Bobby, the Bosnian bear, a little bit of waffle, um, other dogs. I mean, really, this, this talk is just sort of my own personal sort of journey working with these dogs and little snippets of what has worked what didn't what i had to adapt um it isn't a sort of a to z of the way to work with these dogs because all dogs are individual um and what works for one dog might not work for another or it might have to just be slightly tweaked and adapted which is perfectly fine let's make sure i've not missed any questions
But yeah, Carolyn, I hope that answered your question, even though it was um, long-winded, sort of how to get confidence with owners when you're not around. Um, what else do I do to help with owners? Yeah, I touched on it last time on my last live, sort of my inbox is always sort of there. I might not reply straight away. Because if I am out with clients, dogs and stuff, I don't answer my phone. Um, but, you know, if someone wants to just send me a message and say, I'm having a really day, um, this has happened or that's happened or we've had a really close call. I just want to vent to someone who understands, vent away. Uh, send me a message, we'll talk through it, we'll look at the good bits, the bad bits, maybe what we can change next time. Absolutely. Thank you, really enjoyed your talk. Amazing, thank you. Um, yeah, but any quick questions while we've got a few minutes and I'll try and bash you as many as I can. Or if there's space later on in the marathon, I'll uh, do another one on this subject and sort of go a bit more in depth with maybe some other dogs. Because they kind of get sidetracked. Which is me, I, I kind of talk like Billy Conley. I sort of start on one subject Go on to several other subjects before coming back to the original one. Right, there's no other questions. Thank you, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. I do that. Yeah, I'm I'm murdered for it. It's why I don't really do lives on my own page or anything. Because, um, yeah, I, I do tend to do a bit of a Billy Conley. I go around the houses to come back. It all makes sense, in some way, as long as you follow the thread. But, yeah. Um, yep. Oh, definitely did. I get told I'm a little too open and honest with clients as I... The hellish journey with my boy, but you definitely answered it, thank you. Oh, I'm glad I answered it. Um, yes, thanks. Just be yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Great talk, Ben. You should have to do more lives. Oh, thanks, Amy. Oh, you work with me at the shelter. I can still remember that day when you sent me a message saying, can you come and help me in the cat room? And I sent one back saying no. <laughs> and you genuinely thought that's what I meant. And then I appeared to help you out. That was that was quite funny. Thank you and thank you for the tip on the UK sniffer dogs free. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, check it out. Um, and then if you like the stuff that Jamie does at UK sniffer dogs, um, if you go back into that, there is other stuff that he does for owners as well as dog trainers, where you can do like tracking and scent indication stuff. Uh, online um, amazing definitely check it out and if it helps with your dog it helps very real this is what it's all about yep yeah being open and honest about what you do how you do it and that we do make mistakes and we're constantly learning as you can see and that's just a small portion of the stuff that I've got constantly learning about dogs Right, I better go because uh, someone else will be due to come on any second. So thanks, guys. Thanks for all the comments, the questions, um, and I'll speak to you soon.